If somebody comes to me and says, look, give me some evidence as a God and convince me, you know, about Christianity, but you're not allowed to use the Bible. I don't believe the Bible. Here's what I say in my mind. I don't say this to them. I just think this. Who do you think you are? You don't believe the Bible? No. Guess what? I do. You got a problem with that? Come on, make my day. One of the things we need to do as Christians, we need to be the ones on the offensive. If we're so sure and understand that this is the right starting point, we need to stand unashamedly and boldly on that and say, you don't, be you don't believe that? I do. We can actually use observational science to confirm which starting point does make sense of the world. Because when you use observational science with DNA, observational science with DNA actually confirms in the beginning God, not in the beginning hydrogen. In fact, watch this short video from the Creation Museum. If you found an ancient clay tablet with strange characters washed up on the shore, you couldn't read it unless someone had cracked the code. But you'd still know the letters represented a language, even if you didn't know anything else about the author or his civilization. Language is recognizable, even if you can't read it. Take Morse code. It has three basic parts, dots, dashes, and spaces. These three simple parts are combined to represent letters. There are 26 letters in the English language, which are combined to form over 400,000 words. Those words can, of course, be combined into an infinite number of sequences or sentences. There is evidence that DNA represents a language. Four basic units, called nucleotides, combine into a code for 20 amino acids. From those few amino acids, the body forms more than 100,000 proteins. Even if you can't read DNA, it still has all the hallmarks of language, a language that biologists are just now beginning to crack. Every tiny cell in our body is packed with three feet of DNA, three billion nucleotides. The similarity between DNA and human language is uncanny. In addition to codes, both use similar techniques to pack access, rearrange, copy, and translate information. DNA seems to represent a language, the language of life. An unseen author, the creator of heaven and earth, has left a testimony of his existence in the DNA of every living thing. You see, DNA actually confirms your starting point of God's word, does not confirm the starting point of man's word. It is exciting being a Christian, isn't it? And then when you study genetics, DNA actually confirms that there are distinct kinds and there's no mechanism to change one kind into another. When you look at fossils and rock layers all over the earth, actually it confirms catastrophism that uh, to lay down the rock layers, to form the canyons, to form the fossils where you see them, is consistent with catastrophic processes, covering something suddenly, not slow processes over millions of years. And when you look at the human race, which we'll do in detail in one of these sessions, observational science confirms one race, just what you'd expect on the basis of scripture, because you see the Bible is the right starting point. God's word is the right starting point. Now, we live in a culture, and I want to deal with a couple of issues to sort of bring all this together. We live in a culture and where we're being told, oh, if you start with the Bible, then you're being religious. I don't believe the Bible. Don't give me that stuff about the Bible. Anybody, you're imposing your religion on us and so on. And, and we live in a culture in which we're told, if you're going to convince me that there's a God or Christianity, you can't use the Bible. So give me some evidence that there's a God without using the Bible. And I have many people come to me at times and they say, what's the best evidence to use for someone who doesn't believe the Bible so I can't use the Bible? Who, who's heard something like that uh, in, in our culture? Yeah, we have, haven't we? I want you to think about this from perspective of starting points because there are many Christians who say, well, I can't use the Bible because the, you know, they don't believe the Bible, so we can't use the Bible. Well, if you don't use the Bible, if you give up your starting point and there are only two starting points, then you're left with only one starting point. What is it? Man's word. If you give up God's word, there is only one other starting point, man's word. See, it's not a neutral position. 
The Bible says, he who is not with me is against me. If you don't gather, you scatter. You're either for Christ or you're against. There is no neutral position. So if you give up your starting point, then you've actually then adopted the only other starting point, which is what? Man's word, so who's won the debate? Your opponent. You've just lost. You've lost the debate. I was at a religious, uh, well, Christian function uh, a couple of years ago, and there was an atheist debating a Christian, and at this particular uh, organization, they said this was going to be a great debate between a Christian and a non-Christian, a Christian and an atheist. And the first thing that the person who said, you know, he said they were a Christian, debating this atheist, he got up and he said this, because my opponent doesn't believe the Bible, therefore in this debate, uh, we can't use the Bible uh, to, to argue about that. And, and, and as soon as he said that, I said to myself, well, waste of time being here. He just lost the debate. He just gave it to his opponent and may as well leave. And that's right, because he just gave it up. Now, I have people say to me, wait a minute, wait a minute. But you started with a verse of scripture from Romans 1 saying, it's obvious from the creation that there's a God. That's right. Well, in other words, you don't need to start from the Bible. You can just look at the creation and tell there's a God. In fact, when you come into the Creation Museum, we have a video that really details, if you like, Romans 1.20. I call that the intelligent design verse of the Bible. And we have a room in the Creation Museum called the Wonders Room, which I call the intelligent design room of the Bible. And when you come in, you will see Romans 1.20 illustrated like this. Romans 1.20. Actually, I'm really pleased you clapped. I sometimes have audiences that don't clap, and I have to say to them, boy, you're slack. You know, I go to churches, and they see that, and they clap, and then everyone then decides, we better clap, so they clap. And the reason I wanted you to clap is because I wanted to ask you a question. You clap at that, because you look at it and say, wow, it's so obvious as a God, but would you also clap at that? Or this? Or this? or this, or this, or this, and the answer is no. But that's part of what we see out there. And see, here's a point I want to make to us. You know, we live in a time in which people talk about the, the term intelligent design. And I want you to understand something. We use intelligent design arguments. Do you realize the DNA, the DNA section that we just did, that DNA video and so on, when talking about DNA, that's an intelligent design argument. And we use, and Answers in Genesis, intelligent design arguments. But we also have today what's called an intelligent design movement. And there are many people in the Christian world who think, oh, the intelligent design movement, that's the answer to the creation evolution issue in schools and so on. Let me just say this to you. We need to understand something. The intelligent design movement is not a Christian movement. They may use intelligent design arguments, but they're not a Christian movement. And when we look at the intelligent design movement, there are people in them that are Christians, but there are people in them that are non-Christians. And the intelligent design movement doesn't have a history uh, in regard to the universe. What do I mean by that? Well, biblical creationists have a history. I summarize it as the seven C's. God created, man fell, there's a global flood, the Tower of Babel, a very specific history. Evolutionists have a specific history. Big Bang, billions of years, man evolved. The intelligent design movement's not on about a specific history. They're, all they're against is naturalism. That's it. They're against naturalism. What they're saying is life came about by some intelligence, not by natural processes. Who is that intelligence? They, they don't tell you who that intelligence is. And herein lies the problem. 
You see, if you just look at the creation without looking at the word of God, you see, in looking at the creation through the word of God, we know it's a fallen creation. So we know why there's death and suffering in the world. It's not God's fault, it's our fault. But if you don't have the word of God and just look at the creation and say there's an intelligence responsible for this, is that intelligence an ogre? Is that intelligence responsible for all the suffering and death we see in the world? And then, if you think about this as well, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you're not using intelligent design arguments in the context of the word of God, then I suggest to you that you could drive people in the direction of a false god. I personally believe the intelligent design movement potentially is a dangerous movement for this reason. That if you're not telling people who the real God is, the scripture makes it clear we don't want the real God. We'll go after any God but the real God. And so if you're not telling them who the real God is and you're not on about the, the word of God, then you could derive some in the direction of, oh, well, maybe, maybe it's the Muslim God, maybe it's a New Age God, maybe it's a Hindu God, maybe it's a Shinto God. You see, at Answers in Genesis, we will not give those intelligent design arguments devoid of the context of Scripture, the word of God. Those two go together. And... What we need to understand is this. If you're not using God's word, there is only one other starting point, that is man's word, and that's not a neutral position. You're either for Christ or against, or what does it say in James 4? Friendship with the world is enmity, or at war with God. It's not neutral towards God. In Romans 1, we read that men suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Actually, if you think about it from a perspective of an atheist like Richard Dawkins, think about it for a moment. If there's no God... Why even bother worrying about people who believe in God? Why would it matter? You know why it matters? The Bible says the knowledge of God is written on our hearts. It's crying out there's a God. And so to overcome that, people like Richard Dawkins suppress the truth and unrighteousness and they actively fight against it. That's why they're so active in doing what they do. That's why the atheists are so active. They're suppressing the truth because they don't want to acknowledge that, that they're a sinner in submission to a creator. Romans 8 tells us that the carnal mind is enmity against God. We need to understand there is no neutral position. You imagine two knights fighting, and one knight says to the other, before we begin, throw down your sword. Oh, okay, that's a great idea. You know, we laugh at that, but think about it. You know what's happening in our culture? He's a Christian and a non-Christian, and a non-Christian says, well, we can talk about uh, life and the universe and so on, but you, you must leave the Bible out of it. And we say, oh, okay. And we think we're now in neutral ground. No, we're not. See, look at that textbook again, that biology textbook used in the public schools. This is just one of many. How do they define science? You can only use natural processes. They're defining science as naturalism. The supernatural is not allowed. What have they done? They've said our starting point is not God's word, it's man's word, and therefore our religion is naturalism or atheism. People, that's not a neutral position. It's not a neutral position at all. And we've got to remember that faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. It's God's word that is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's God's word that goes forth from his mouth and shall not return unto him void. And so people say to me, okay, so how, how do you say we should argue? Well, I look at it like this. If somebody comes to me and says, look, give me some evidence as a God and convince me you know, about Christianity, but you're not allowed to use the Bible. I don't believe the Bible. Here's what I say in my mind. I don't say this to them. I just think this. Who do you think you are? telling me that you're going to set the terms of this debate so that you win, so that I lose. How dare you, how dare you set the terms of the debate like that? Who, who do you think you are telling me that I've got to have your starting point? I'm not going to do that. That's what I think up here. I think a lot of things when you ask me questions. But here's what I say. You don't believe the Bible? No. Guess what? I do. You got a problem with that? Come on, make my day. <laughs> you see, one of the things that... One of the things we need to do as Christians, we need to be on the offensive, not being offensive, you understand what I mean. We need to be the ones on the offensive. If we're so sure and understand that this is the right starting point, we need to stand unashamedly and boldly on that and say, you don't, be you don't believe that? I do. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show you when I start with the Bible, it makes sense to the world. I'm going to use observational science. I'm going to show you over and over again, it confirms that the Bible is the right starting point because you've got the wrong starting point, you've got a problem. Number one, most Christians don't even know they have a starting point. 
You know one of the problems we've got in our churches? The Bible's here and we've got dinosaurs over here and we've got abortion here and gay marriage over here and so on. And we're trying to bring all these things together because we're not taught by and large that we start from the Bible to build our whole worldview. It starts from God's word. And that's one of the reasons why many Christians have problems. How do you explain dinosaurs? What about the, the Big Bang? How do you explain the Grand Canyon? What, you know, people often say to me, how do you fit that into the Bible? You don't fit anything into the Bible. You start with the Bible and build a worldview that explains the evidence. And then you use observational science to investigate the present, which confirms your starting point. But then we get another problem. The non-Christian doesn't think they have a starting point. Illustration. I had an atheist in my office interviewing me for the BBC before the Creation Museum opened. And she was from California, has an anti-creation organization in California. And she said to me at one stage, she said, so you admit you start with the Bible? I said, yes. And she said, and you're not prepared to change anything in the Bible, are you? No. You're not prepared to change anything in the account of creation in Genesis, are you? I said, no. She said, see, that's religion. I'm a real scientist. We start with evidence. We develop theories as new evidence comes along. We're prepared to change our theories. Your views are set. You can't change anything. She said, whereas I'm prepared to change because I'm a real scientist. When new evidence comes along, I change my views, my theories. I said, oh, it's very interesting. I said, can I ask you a question? Yes. Now, you're an atheist. Is that right? Yes. She even won secular humanist of the year award at one stage. So you're an atheist, yes. You don't believe in God, that's right. So the Bible's not true, that's right. And so the account of Genesis and the Bible's not relevant to this discussion of origins, that's right. I said, tell me, are you prepared to change any of that? And you know, I can't prove it, but I saw a little, just a little quiver in the side of her mouth. <laughs> because you know what I just showed her? You have a starting point. Your starting point is the starting point of the public schools. You're throwing God and the Bible and, and out and, and you're saying, whatever I find out there, it can only explain by natural processes. There is no God. The Bible's not true. You have a starting point. You see, we all have that starting point, either God's word or man's word. And you know, as you start to think about this, do you realize when Christians accommodate millions of years and evolution into the Bible, as soon as you introduce fallible man into God's infallible word, your starting point is no longer God's word because now you can never know that you've got all evidence. Your starting point now is what? Man's word. Now, as you look at that, there's something else we want to consider to finish off with here, and it's this. And people say to me, okay, so, so what you're really saying is when I am, as a Christian, start with God's word, and I'm talking to a non-Christian who starts with man's word, that really the argument's not up here because we're interpreting the same evidence differently because we have different starting points, so the real argument's down here. That's right. So really what we've got to do is to get that person to change their starting point. That's right. How do we do that? Oh, we can't do it. What do you mean? You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that we are dead in trespasses and sins. Lazarus couldn't raise himself from the dead. Only God could. When I'm in the office with an atheist like that person I, I was being interviewed by, or I'm sometimes on radio interviews or debates on radio, being on TV, here's what I have to remind myself. Now, when you're talking to a non-Christian, they're a walking dead person. And as a walking dead person, you can't raise them from the dead. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. We're told there is none who does good, no, not one. There's none that seeks after God. And it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. Only God can save us. It's only a work of the Holy Spirit on their hearts that can change their starting point. And then... But then the question comes... Well, what's the role of observational science? Why do you have a creation museum? Why are you giving all this answer, these answers in geology and biology and astronomy and anthropology? What's the point of all that? Oh, I'm glad you asked that question. Because the Bible also says, concerning the Lord, that it is not his will that any should perish, 
And he says, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they be sent? We need to go out there and preach. We need to go out there and give answers. Always be ready to give a defense or to give an answer. In fact, God's word calls our preaching foolishness. A foolishness of, of preaching. Foolishness through the message preached. And the message we preach to them is, is foolishness. And Hebrews tells us, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God is raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. How do we bring all that together? You know what? When we do it God's way, it is phenomenally relaxing. Do you know how I relax when I'm facing some of these atheists and these scientists who, uh, PhD secular scientists who just hate God and they're interviewing me on radio or for a newspaper article, whatever it is? Here's how I relax. Provided I have studied to show uh, ourselves approved as workmen under God, rightly, unashamedly, you know, dividing the word of truth. We study God's word. We know what we believe, know why we believe it. We've been to Answers in Genesis and got all those resources out there to be equipped. That was a little ad. We get those answers to be equipped so that we have the answers to be able to defend our faith and answer the skeptical questions of the age. And provided we've done our best and done our study there, and we go in there and saying, now they're a walking dead person, there's nothing I can do to raise them from the dead, only God can raise them from the dead. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to be like Paul and confute and dispute and powerfully argue. I'm going to use every argument I can. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do what the Bible says. I'm going to give them answers. I'm going to defend the faith, I'm going to contend for the faith. But I'm going to do it in the context of always pointing them to the scriptures. I'm, I'm on about the Bible and faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. I'm on about the gospel. So I'm going to use everything I can to convince them of the truth, to, to answer their skeptical questions, to point out uh, their logical fallacies, but always in the context of the Word of God. I'm not going to, to, to separate this from the Word of God. It's not just going to be intelligent design arguments, because what I'm on about is my starting point, the Word of God. And then I'm going to stand back and recognize I've done the best I can. It's God who opens their heart to the truth. You see, God brings those two things together. People, we're finite beings. We can't understand infinite God. I don't understand how God does that. How does God work on our hearts to open our hearts? It's God who brings it all together. But we have to go out there and be faithful and do it his way. You know what? That's basically it. Do it God's way. Go out there and preach and teach and give them answers and do the best you can to convince them and stand back and say, and provided, provided, I'm, I'm doing it in the context of the Word of God. It's God's Word that's sharper than a two-edged sword. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And you know, I've had people come to me afterwards, uh, after they've given a, a presentation like this, and they said, you know, I've been arguing with my uncle about Christianity for years, and you know what, though? Because he didn't believe the Bible, I thought you couldn't use the Bible. I just realized I've been arguing in the wrong way. Other people have come to me and said, I've been trying to argue with one of my close relatives and I've been trying to convince them and I've done the best I can. I feel a failure. But, but I realize tonight, provided I've done my best and I'm honoring God's word, it's God who opens their heart. That's right. And you can relax in that. We do the best we can, but we relax knowing it's God who raises people from the dead. Now, let's apply this. Your starting point determines your worldview. When the starting point in America was God's word, the worldview that permeated the culture, marriage, one man for one woman, abortion uh, w was considered murder and, and so on. There's right and there's wrong and there's good and there's bad. But you see, if your starting point is man's word, then who decides truth? When they had no king to tell them what to do, they all did what was right in their own eyes. It's moral relativism. It depends on who can impose their view on the culture. What's happened in America? America has changed starting points. Starting points from God's word to man's word. It's happened in the government. It's happened in the courts. It's happened in the education system. And people, saddest of all, which is why we're losing this culture, it has happened in the church. Because you see, when so many church leaders have done what they've done in England and all across Europe, adopted the pagan religion of the age, man's ideas to explain life without God, evolution millions of years, man's fallible ideas into God's word, contaminated God's word, 
undermine the authority of the word, we're losing the coming generations. And the reason that many people in the church, and, and, and they're in the majority in this nation, are not affecting the culture, but we have a small group of secularists who are affecting the whole culture, is because Christians have been, in a sense, they've been ashamed of the word of God. We have given up our starting point. Do you know why we lost the battle in the public schools? We gave up the starting point. And you know, even when we're fighting in the courts, we're told by the attorneys, oh, but if you mention the Bible, they say that's being religious and you know you can't. People, we need to honor God's word. And we need to stand up for what's right. And, and, and just because the world tells us that God's word is not true, or you know, when the world is telling us you can't use the Bible, we need to honor God's word because God will honor those who honor him. And God will bless those who honor him. And you see, we've been ashamed of God's word. And so we've been out there fighting the abortion issue and the gay marriage issue with all sorts of uh, arguments like conservative values, it's wrong, it's what's good for the culture, tradition, founding fathers. And we've got all these so-called conservative values. But people, they're just opinions. Ultimately, they're just opinions. And remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. It's God's word that sharpened uh, than a two-edged sword and shall not return unto him void. We need to be out there unashamedly fighting these issues, waving the Bible, if you like, standing on God's word, out there helping people understand this is why abortion is wrong. This is why gay marriage is wrong. Because this is true, because this is the right starting point. And when they accuse us of imposing a religion on, on the culture, we need to say, but you're imposing your religion because you've got a different starting point. They don't want to acknowledge that, but you know what? We need to be out there using that argument. You know, what, you know what's happened? We've had years and years and years of Christians trying to fight the issues without the Bible. Has it worked? No, it has not worked. And you know what? We've lost the education system. We're losing the culture. That what this nation needs to do is to return to the authority of the Word of God. Unashamedly, uncompromisingly, let's get out there and stand on the authority of the Word. I really want to encourage you as to what can happen when you give logical answers to a non-Christian. I remember being at the University of Wales and after my lecture, a student came down to me and said, that was radical. I said to him, what was radical? He said, Christians having answers. Well, that's the radical response you want to get and you can get when you give those answers.